welcome to the first program of the 2020 Islesboro Forum. On behalf of the Islesboro Forum Committee, I am Gail Jackson, and I'm the moderator of today's program. This is our 28th year of presenting distinguished speakers who are experts in various fields, from current events to foreign policy, the environment, history, science, education, literature, and the cultural arts. And we always also include subjects of relevance close to home to the island community. This is our 28th year, but it's our first year of presenting programs streamed live via Zoom webinar. In May of this year, a group of us resolved that we could not let the pandemic kill the forum. In fact, uh, the Zoom webinar format energize us to think way outside the box. We no longer had to limit our speaker options to people physically present on the island. And in fact, one of our speakers this summer will be located in Hawaii when we stream live. Our committee quickly came up with about 35 excellent speaker ideas, and we voted to select our top six choices to present what we thought would be a manageable six programs this year. This is a different modus operandi from what we have employed in the past. Those who are familiar with the forum from previous years will recall the clipboard we circulated at every program asking for your speaker ideas. We had no way or time to do that this year, but we can start asking you now for speaker ideas for 2021. We invite you to go to the islesboroforum.org website and fire away with your ideas. And while you're there, please hit the donate button. Our costs for six programs will be about $1,000, and that does not account for the many hours of volunteer from our donated by our committee. We hope you will consider these programs are of value and will want to support them with a donation of as little as $10 or more. I want to close these introductory remarks with an expression of gratitude for the dedication and support of our eight other committee members. Their names are listed on the website. And finally, I want to acknowledge the invaluable contribution of our technical producer, Michael Hutcherson. He's a wizard at what he does and is making the delivery of these programs possible. Now I will turn the program over to John Rexwaller, the island resident who has brought us our speaker and has known him since they studied together at Oxford as Rhodes Scholars. John will introduce our distinguished speaker on the topic that is probably top of mind for all of us, the COVID-19 pandemic. A quick reminder as to our format, Dr. Brennan will deliver his own remarks. After that, we will have time for questions and answers using the Q&A function you should find at the bottom right of your computer screen. And now, John, over to you to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Gail. Um, I'm very happy to be able to introduce you to Troy Brennan, whom I have known since 1976 when we were at Oxford together. We were in neighboring rooms in Hartford College. Our rooms were built somewhere in the 15th or 16th century, give or take. But after a couple of terms of British institutional food, we moved out into a flat together to cook for ourselves and to reacquaint ourselves with green salad. Post-Oxford, Troy was at Yale, where in 1984, he received his MD and JD, picking up a master's in public health along the way. After his internship and residency at Mass General, he joined the faculty at Harvard in the School of Public Health and the Law School, 
where he remained until 2006. While teaching at the medical and law schools, Troy also had his own internal medicine practice. He was the CEO of Brigham and Women's Physician Organization. He published numerous articles, PubMed loses count at about 250, and he's published a number of books. As, as an indication of the breadth of Troy's interests, consider the titles. Uh, Just Doctoring, Medical Ethics in the Liberal States, in, we look, looked, in which he looked at John Rawls' theory of justice as applied to the patient's expansive sort of paternalistic view of the physician, while the law tries to rein in the physician's role. Also, new rules, regulation of markets and the quality of American healthcare. That's quite a topic. He wrote that with Don Berwick, who went on to become the head of the Department of Health and Human Services. He was a co-author of the landmark Harvard study on the medical malpractice system, which in part concluded, and I quote, for roughly the same dollar amount, about 60 billion, now being spent on tort system that compensates only a handful of victims, it would be possible to fund comprehensive disability insurance for all patients significantly disabled by a medical accident. I'm just saying good luck with that one. Moral imperatives and market solutions. Is healthcare a right? And Troy wrote that in the University of Chicago Law Review back in 1998. So then in 2006, Troy gave up a tenured slot at Harvard and went over to the dark side as uh, chief medical officer of Aetna. He was there until he moved to CVS in 2008, and he promptly engineered the acquisition of his old employer, and he got CVS to stop selling cigarettes. Now, as CMO, Troy oversees the CVS Minute Clinic operations, clinical and medical affairs, and the overall healthcare strategy for all of CVS. The US healthcare system is a mess. Uh, piecemeal attempts to address the holy grail trinity of access, affordability, and cost are politically difficult in the best of times. In our current political environment, I would say impossible. Traditional service lines are being blurred as hospital buys physicians, and they offer insurance, and insurers buy their own hospitals and surgery centers like United Healthcare. And retail drug stores like CVS offer medical services, the Minute Clinics, and they buy insurers like Aetna. Lay all this on an employer-based healthcare system with huge variations between states and the rest of the world just looks at it and just shakes its head. So now we have a pandemic that tears off all the band-aids and shows the system for exactly what it is. And I cannot think of a more qualified person to address this at this time than Dr. Troy Brennan. Troy, we look forward to your remarks and welcome to Islesboro. It being 5.45 now, I'll talk for maybe 20 or 25 minutes and then hold plenty of time for questions we can get back to Gail. So if I show the first slide, I know Michael's got the magical presentation here. So, so th th these coronaviruses are not novel. I mean, we refer to this as a novel coronavirus because it's the first one we've seen, but coronaviruses are around. And in fact, coronaviruses are either the leading or the second leading cause of the common cold in the United States and across the world. And it does tend to be a virus that has a bit of a, of a seasonal um, uh, uh, ebb and flow but not nearly as much as many other viruses like the influenza viruses do. So if you get a summer cold, the chances are that you've got a cold from one of the beta coronaviruses. And they're called coronaviruses because everybody loves to see these sort of scanning electron microscopy now, which shows these spikes on the outside um, of the virus. And the virus is uh, typical of coronaviruses. Its RNA takes advantage of the uh, cell it infects own system of producing proteins. It can't produce those proteins itself uh, and basically takes advantage of the host DNA to reassemble um, itself. Um, so very common. We would expect for, mm, in studies of coronaviruses that have been done in the United States, for instance, the amount of coronavirus would decrease to about 40% of what it was in February by June or July um, and uh, then pick back up again um, in the fall. So uh, contributing to sort of fall coughs and colds and certainly this coronavirus will act the same way. Now there are two of these coronaviruses that have come out in the last 15 years that have been more deadly. SARS uh, was the first example and MERS, which was uh, uh, from the desert area of uh, South Asia um, is the other. Both deadly, uh, SARS, MERS more so uh, than SARS, but 
you know, uh, showing uh, a, a tremendous morbidity and mortality compared to the background um, uh, coronaviruses. And if you get to the next page, I think it's easy to sort of demonstrate the kinds of things that the virologist looks at. The first thing at the top is that RO number, which is, is R0 or R0, they call it. And it's the number of people who can be infected by one individual. Now, some things are, some viruses are very infectious, like measles has an R0 of about 13 or something like that. This, the R0 associated with COVID is, was thought when this slide was put together, three months ago maybe, to be 2 to 2.5. It may be higher than that. Um, and there's a, a one uh, genotype of the virus that's basically replaced all the other genotypes um, because there is genetic flux within um, these viruses. Uh, but there's one that's dominating now. And it may have, this is what you hear Dr. Fauci saying these days, he, they're looking at maybe a, an R naught of three, especially to see the amount of spread that we're seeing in the summer um, of a coronavirus. It takes a long time to incubate. Um, and people are infectious for two to three days before they start to show symptoms, which makes it a much more difficult virus to control than things like the flu virus, where almost you're infectious about the time you show symptoms. The hospitalization rates, they're changing now. Again, so we're seeing more and learning more about the epidemiology as we see more people infected. The hospitalization rate was thought to be about 19%, but that's based on sort of Chinese and then Italian, Spanish, and then uh, uh, New York and Massachusetts and New Jersey experience, that hospitalization rate probably dropped down to about 15% or something like that. And the case fatality rate looks much more close to something like 0.6 or 0.7%. So, you know, about uh, five to eight times as uh, deadly um, as the flu, which in a given year in the United States will kill 50 or 60 or 70,000 people, depending on sort of the um, uh, uh, flu pandemic. The worst one that we had in, in the recent past probably killed well, just slightly more than 100,000 people. So, so a common but dead, more deadly virus um, and you know, uh, uh, basically sort of doing what you'd expect. All the virus does is spread. And, it continues to spread. The coronaviruses themselves are also on a spectrum with regard to the body's response to them. So um, MERS and SARS look like they generate lasting memory by the immune system. So so-called so convalescent antibodies. You basically are exposed to the virus, you remember it, and then if re-exposed, your body immediately develops an antibody response and clears it. Um, that's the same thing you get from um, a vaccine. That's basically an antibody response that's remembered by the body. The uh, non-malignant um, uh, uh, coronaviruses often have a very minor um, a period of time which you have convalescent antibodies, if at all. So lots of, of um, sort of watching what's going on here right now. An initial report from China suggesting that there wasn't a great deal of convalescent antibody development, especially in people who were asymptomatic or had a minor case, which might make some sense. A, a more um, a thoroughgoing effect would probably prompt a stronger antibody response and maybe um, a memory associated with that. But at least right now, I think people are feeling like there is going to be a reasonable immunological memory of the virus. And that's important for two reasons. One is that you know, it makes you much more confident about the ability to develop um, a, um, a reasonable vaccine. And secondly, unfortunately, in some ways, it looks like it also creates the opportunity for so-called herd immunity. Once a virus circulates through a, a, a population and people remember the virus and can have their antibodies attacked, in other words, can't get infected again, the antibody has, the, the virus has a lot less targets to go to and it slowly but surely shuts itself off because there's nowhere else um, uh, to infect. Um, and getting to herd immunity in the United States with this particular virus would probably require something like 180 or 200 million people out of 330, maybe slightly more than that, to be infected with the virus and to have convalescent antibodies and remember uh, the fact that they were exposed um, um, to the virus. But um, uh, the reason why I mention that is that 
only in the past sort of week or so has the prospect begun to raise itself that the uh, uh, epidemic is so out of control that we're marching towards um, uh, herd immunity relatively quicker uh, than we thought um, uh, that we might. Um, so it's a, the other point I might make on the next slide is that, well, first of all, these are the basically the two things that one um, is um, um, weighing. If you're a public figure um, or a public health individual, first of all, you can shut off the uh, infection if you socially distance everyone. So if people uh, basically sort of stay six feet away from one another, wear masks, um, avoid uh, large gatherings, uh, the virus is really incapable of being transmitted. I mean, rare case, and there is some reports now that WHO thinks that in certain situations, the virus may actually be in the atmosphere as opposed to attached to a small amount of moisture called fomite that comes out of one's mouth when one sneezes um, um, or talks or out of one's nose. But those would only be settings where um, you're basically in a stifling situation and you've got a lot of virus around. A hospital might be a kind of place where that uh, would happen. But otherwise, uh, infections are going to occur when people come into contact with virus that's on fomites that are coming out of people's noses and mouths. So it is possible, and certainly um, uh, the European countries, from Switzerland, Germany, great examples of this, have been able to shut off the transmission of the virus by observing social distancing, um, and as a result of that, keep infection rates at a very uh, low level. But with that comes, obviously, sort of uh, economic disaster, uh, because you have to shut down so much of the economy to do so, and this just shows the unprecedented rise in unemployment, unemployment that occurred. So clearly that's a matter that the politicians are having to sort of consider as they consider what um, um, uh, measures put into place. But on the next slide is how we think about it from sort of the public health point of view, this one. Um, and you can see what this is. And remember, we talk a lot about this uh, when the uh, pandemic first started, that is, flatten the curve. And in New York and New Jersey, and to some extent Massachusetts and parts of Connecticut, um, in the state of Washington, the initial bloom of the viral infection, especially in places like um, Elmhurst, New York, which um, uh, is the sort of place where I lived there for a year after um, uh, finishing school while my wife was clerking for a judge, uh, in New York, we lived in Jackson Heights next door to Elmhurst, but two very, very busy um, uh, subway trains come together there, the E and F train um, on the one hand and the 7 train on the other. And it's the busiest um, subway stop uh, probably in the country, certainly in New York. But um, uh, in, th in those particular neighborhoods, Jackson Heights and Elmhurst, probably 50 or 60 or 70 percent of people were infected with the virus. And when you get that many people infected with the virus, whether the death rate is 0.6% or 1% or 2.5%, you're going to end up with a lot of people in the hospital. And so basically from a public health point of view, what you're trying to do is put enough social distancing in place so that you flatten the curve and you maintain uh, the uh, healthcare systems operating reasonably. That is not completely converted over to taking care of people who are infected with COVID. In Massachusetts and in New York um, and in New Jersey, we got to that state in April, um, and um, we were very worried that the uh, uh, number of cases was going to outstrip our ability to take care um, of people. Now we've got that same set of concerns in um, um, other parts um, of the country. So um, I think if we go to the next slide, from a public health point of view. What you'd like to do is to, um, uh, if you start at the top or, or so, start with someone being testing positive. Um, if they test positive, um, whether they've got symptoms or not, consider them a confirmed COVID case. You monitor with an O instead of an E uh, their symptoms. You interview all the people who they've been close to. You obtain a list of contacts. You refer those people for testing. And so this is a sort of contact tracing um, approach um, that 
um, uh, you utilize in order to identify people who have been infected works very well across Europe um, and throughout um, uh, East Asia. We've been not so good at it. In fact, uh, most of the states have lacked resources to um, uh, undertake contact tracing. I was shocked when we first got into the testing business in early April at CDS. We had a long history of using uh, point of care tests for diagnosing viruses and as point of care tests became available for COVID, we opened up large tent sites. And so as we opened these up in the state, so I was talking to the state officials and said, we want to have the contact tracing closely integrated with this. In Georgia, there wasn't anybody who I could find who even understood what contact tracing was. Uh, in Massachusetts, they knew what it was, but uh, they've since sort of shut it down because they just found that they weren't identifying uh, enough people. When things get out of control, they get out of control. The entire Sun Belt in this country is now out of control with regard to contact tracing. It's impossible to do it. There are so many new cases. Um, and so uh, as a result, you know, the only thing that we have that we can rely on is um, um, social distancing. And the next slide kind of shows exactly how bad things are. It's about a week um, out of um, um, date. Uh, we're into July and this curve that was beginning to get up to sort of 50,000 is now typically going to 60,000 has gotten as high as 70,000. And quite frankly, when a virus like this starts to circulate like this, the only way I think about it is when I was a kid, my older brother used to run swimming pools and we'd put this um, stuff in the pools to clean them um, at the beginning of the year, basically an acid solution. And the acid would be dropped in sort of four places and then slowly you'd see the color of the water uh, change. And the more concentrated acid you use, the quicker the color changed, but it went from the place where you poured it in slowly sort of throughout the pool. That's basically what's happening now. But uh, it's, it's out of control, um, no matter what um, the politicians say, if you look at it from a sort of viral epidemiology point of view. And the bad part is it's very hard to sort of see how the states where it is out of control are going to do something to try to reduce it because they're so concerned about going into another shutdown. In fact, they seem to be committed to um, uh, continuing to allow a reasonable amount um, of infection. This issue about the schools is perhaps the sort of best example of that. They don't want schools shut down and the federal government doesn't want schools shut down uh, but that'll be a true spreader event. If I look at this and I look at these curves, what I've been saying for the past sort of three weeks is that, you know, for those who are sports fans, there can't really be any sports. Um, you know, the infection is going to percolate uh, into the sporting teams um, and somebody will get quite sick and some will die. And I don't see how kids go back to university, really. Um, uh, that seems to me to be a recipe for a uh, disaster. If they do, then you would expect an infection rates like this, especially in the Sunbelt part of the, of, of the country, that you know everyone will be infected quite rapidly, and um, uh, the and there will be you know sort of morbidity and mortality associated with it. If you look at the next slide, the thing that's been sort of um, most concerning for us from the point of view of um, the um, uh, current pandemic is that uh, we haven't seen death rates rising until this past week. What you would have expected was this is moving so fast, you know, it's sort of a doubling overall of infection rates over a two week period of time. You'd expect the mortality and morbidity not to catch up with the actual infection rate. And what you're beginning to see is the death rate increasing and slowly but surely the hospitals in Dade County, uh, potentially in Orlando, uh, in Houston, um, looking at Dallas, in Phoenix, in Los Angeles, they're slowly getting to the point where they can't take any more patients into intensive care units because the intensive care units are being displaced by people who are developing bad pneumonia uh, from um, the, the SARS-CoV-2 um, infection. So, you know, it, it, you're always at one, any one period of time, you're always sort of two weeks out. You know what's going to happen for at least the next two weeks. And so for at least the next two weeks, there's going to, it's almost impossible to say there's not going to be increased death rates, increasing closures of um, healthcare systems, 
and um, um, you know more infections. The infection rates haven't budged. In the testing centers that we have in Georgia, uh, and in Florida, uh, and in Texas, you know we're seeing consistently 35 to 40 percent um, uh, rates of positive tests. So uh, it's a nightmare situation. If you were the governor of Florida uh, with 15,000 cases reported yesterday. Um, you know, you'd have to be very concerned if you've got to shut the entire um, economy down. And yet, uh, they show no signs of doing that. There's no prescription for mask wearing. And they're talking about the kids going back to school. So from an epidemiological point of view, it's just basically impossible to understand. The, the, the way that I look at it, though, when thinking about sort of our workforce and um, how we're doing our planning is on the next page. This basically sort of shows uh, on the left-hand side, these are the two parameters the CDC says that you're supposed to follow, but most of the newspapers don't put this together. I have probably about 1,600 people now at CDS who work in analytics, and uh, half of them seem to be working on analytics around SARS right now. But what this shows on the left-hand side is the number of new cases per million. Uh, and this is, again, outdated. Uh, Arizona is now up to about 600. It gives you some sense about that when New York was at the height of its uh, uh, worst day. It was at about 530. And New Jersey and Massachusetts both topped out at about 420. Florida, South Carolina, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, they'll all go beyond that um, in the course of the next um, um, uh, uh, two weeks. And so what one would expect is that you know, with unconstrained viral spread, even though um, it is correct, it's more, you know, the, 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 the average infection rate is in a younger person right now. Sooner or later, it spreads to older people because younger people come into contact with older people and it gets into nursing homes and then it gets into the hospitals and then the hospitals begin to shut down. So if you were a betting person right now, as a viral epidemiologist, what you'd be betting on is that there's gonna be massive shutdowns um, of the healthcare systems across the Sun Belt, and probably stronger and stronger restrictions on travel uh, from uh, those uh, states to the states that are trying to uh, keep themselves sort of relatively uninfected. If we went down lower on this list, you'd find that uh, Vermont is at about nine new infections um, uh, per million people per day. Uh, Connecticut is now down to 25. Massachusetts is about 30. New York is at about 40. Now, mind you, just to again put this in perspective, the French decided that they had to get to a level of 12 cases per million per day to open things up. Um, the Chinese were unwilling to accept anything other than zero. They, and the reason why? They were so concerned about the fall because they know that the coronavirus will be back um, um, in the fall. And the Germans were willing to go to 16. Um, Vermont's the only state in the union uh, that would uh, uh, fit into those categories right now. So our public health response has been uh, relatively um, uh, somewhere in between weak and monstrously uh, bad, uh, one would have to say. Now, I think um, what the, um, uh, I think that's the end of the slides. Let's just see if there's one more, because I have a longer slide deck. Oh, this just shows that the, the point I, I made before, so we don't need that. I did want to talk a little bit since this is basically sort of what we as a country are uh, betting on uh, is the um, uh, vaccines. And there's a series of different vaccines that are um, uh, being developed. My um, uh, front runner right now um, is uh, the, the uh, Chinese uh, number one um, vaccine that they're developing. They have two or three that are going into production. Uh, but uh, the reason why I like the Chinese is because it's the old style of manufacturing. It's called live attenuated virus. So they actually use the coronavirus itself. They attenuate it and they use that uh, to make the vaccine. There's not enough viral spread in China right now to test uh, that kind of vaccine. So the Chinese will uh, basically work with the army and um, They'll give the vaccine to uh, 15 or 20,000 um, um, uh, uh, soldiers, 
and then uh, they won't give it to another 15 or 20, and then all 30 or 40,000 will be exposed to the virus. So likely, you know, basically aerosolize virus and place it directly sort of in the nares. And that's called so-called direct contact. Now we do that with some other kinds of viruses, but not deadly viruses. And so it's been a big ethical debate on the United States side, but I don't have any doubt that the Chinese will uh, employ that um, technique because they're looking at sort of the big picture and they're willing to expose uh, some uh, very healthy young people to the virus, knowing that some of those people will get sick and some could even die, uh, but they'll get an answer as to what the um, uh, value of the virus is very soon. In the United States uh, and across the rest of the world, people are using a variety of technologies. There is um, live attenuated virus, dead attenuated virus, both things that have been used uh, before. But we're also using sort of advanced techniques. One set of techniques is to take um, um, other viruses, adenoviruses, and put the certain kinds of the uh, viral DNA from SARS-CoV-2 in those viruses, infect people with those viruses, the uh, part of the SARS-CoV-2 that's in those viruses will have proteins that are developed by human cells, and those will uh, uh, provide protection. Never before been done, but still sort of one of the uh, two of the leading candidates, both Johnson & Johnson um, and the AstraZeneca University of Oxford programs um, are using that kind of viral vector. As well, you know, there's a company that's called Moderna, uh, which is an mRNA uh, virus. They're basically taking uh, naked messenger RNA uh, and, and again, sort of uh, is, uh, putting that into people. It gets taken up by um, our cells and then that messenger RNA uh, uses the ribosome system uh, within the um, um, uh, human cells to produce certain proteins that will again provide uh, protection. Now, Moderna has never uh, had a product uh, that's been marketed. Um, and this particular technology, as well as the adenovirus technology, is um, uh, completely new. But these are the kinds of things that we are uh, betting on. Um, the uh, Innovio, which just joined uh, the five, uh, now six, different companies that are part of the um, uh, OWS process in the United States, uh, the effort to speedily develop um, a virus that we're spending billions of dollars on, is a DNA vaccine. So using um, um, uh, DNA to uh, develop. Now, the, the, I think we will get a virus from one of these, can uh, a virus. I think we will get a vaccine from one of these candidates. And I would suspect it's reasonable to think that the, at least the way they're signaling us now, that uh, we could see something in the spring, um, in, in the summer. But then there's a, obviously a massive effort you one has to think through uh, in order to um, um, vaccinate two or 300 million people in the United States, let alone sort of across the world. So it's a several year process to accomplish that. But if you think about sort of major economies, they may be able to get themselves moving sometime um, um, in the um, um, spring. This would be really great. I know that the federal administration is hoping to get something out sort of in September, October, November. I just don't see that really as a possibility. Moreover, we got very little information about these viruses. The only information we do have is that people are getting pretty sick when they get them, which is not a great sign usually with um, a vaccine. So unless I was being asked to be sort of a member of a trial uh, for uh, purposes of trying to move things along quickly, and I won't be because I just turned 65. Um, I wouldn't be like an average citizen trying to be the first to line up um, for these um, uh, vaccines. I'm willing and, in, and capable, at least in, in my uh, current job, to maintain very reasonable sort of social distancing and wait and see sort of how the vaccine develops. So the bottom line is, you know, sort of hopefully we get to vaccine probably after the first of the year, but in a dreadful situation, from a virologist's point of view, a viral epidemiology point of view, a much more dreadful situation than is being talked about in the press or being talked about by sort of government experts, it's really hard to see what steps are going to be taken um, as this thing gets out of control. And it will spread. It's basically sort of like those concentrations we put in the swimming pool. There's nothing that stops it unless you put in place very, very aggressive 
um, uh, physical um, and social distancing. So it's not, you know, I keep telling the people in my company are tired of hearing from me about this, but, you know, we have to be sort of planning to operate because we have 180,000 people who are going to be on the front line at our CVS stores no matter what. So we have to be prepared for that. So I have to keep sort of drilling them on that. But I don't have a very happy message here. Nonetheless, I'd be uh, happy to try to take some questions or at least join in the discussion. Thanks so much for listening to me. Gail, I'll turn yes. it over. Thank you, <clears throat> Troy. Thank you very much. Obviously, a deeply knowledgeable um, set of data and information that you've presented, and it represents decades of your experience uh, in the field in public health and in delivery of medical um, services. So we thank you for that. I must say, it is more sobering. Uh, when you hear it in concentrated form directly uh, as you've delivered the message. So um, I'm going to, uh, I want to give our audience a chance to ask you some more questions. Um, I'm going to start by handing it over to your good buddy from Oxford, John Rexwaller, and then we'll watch the Q&A um, column over here and I'll call on people as uh, they raise their hands to say they have something they'd like to ask about. I see we already have a question teed up, but I'm gonna turn it to John first. So over to you, John. Um, thank you, Gail. Um, Troy, we've, we've got, um, even if it's short term, as you see the, um, the virus spread heading into the southeast, there's going to be more shutdowns, more unemployment. Um, people are going to be outside the system. We have an employee-based healthcare system um, at the moment, so many people get their, um, get their healthcare through their companies. Um, there's going to be layoffs. They may keep their insurance for a while, uh, but it's going to get, um, it's going to get worse uh, before, it, uh, before it gets better. So now we have an employer-based healthcare system. The, a the ACA has helped some of that a little bit, um, but, it's, uh, but it's going to overwhelm um, that area. So is, is any of this, and I'm asking you to delve a bit into politics, I suppose, is any of this gonna give people a kick in the ass that we actually need to change the healthcare system as a whole, particularly the employer-based system? Um, or what other changes is this um, is this pandemic going to, uh, is it enough of a wake up call to do anything? Yeah. Um, you know, I use, I, I, I do give a set of sort of health policy lectures still. And uh, or for the last sort of two or three years, I've kind of dined out on one that, you know, basically has a picture of, of, of uh, President Trump from um, uh, May of uh, 2016. And the point I try to make is that nobody in this room was going to predict that Trump was going to be elected president. So, you know, don't, don't, when you think about health policy, don't mix that up with politics because politics are not predictable. Um, but, um, you know, I try to then rely on demographics to make my points. But, um, you know, at least, it, at least now, you know, what you say is that, you know, he owns the pandemic um, at this point. And uh, as things worsen, it's hard, you know, sort of, again, you, you got whatever you got right now, you got for another 14 days. So, it's hard to see sort of um, uh, anything changing in the major states for at least um, another month, by which point we'll probably be at something like 110 or 120,000 new cases a day. Um, and, um, and as a result of that, there'll be sort of major shutdowns. And, and even places like Texas and Florida will be forced to reshut down their economies. Um, and that will make for poor politics. And so, all you've got to say, all this, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, all this is sort of helping um, Biden's cause. And it's probably helping uh, the cause in the Senate as well. So I say that by way of there's at least right now, if you went with the polls right now, you would have a Democratic Senate um, and um, um, a Democrat in the White House uh, in January. Look, lots of things can happen in between now and then, so you can't predict that. But if that were the case, then I think it'll move healthcare legislation pretty quickly. I think Biden is an incrementalist, and so he'll probably do something like his 60, let's go to um, um, uh, uh, 
Medicare down to 60, but the direction that we are we will head, um, and I would have predicted we would head anyway as a result of demographics, the virus will help move this along, um, is to some sort of Medicare for all system. And the big question there is gonna be, you know, is there participation of private insurance companies or is it all sort of a traditional um, um, Medicare approach? And I suspect uh, it'll be the former. So um, uh, what one has to hope is that as part of that, there's more of a focus on restrict, on reducing the costs associated with care. And as a result of that, keeping, uh, getting room um, in the uh, government fisc for redevelopment in, uh, of the public health system. Because as I said, the public health system in most states today is a joke. Um, and uh, it's all the result of uh, budgets, which across the board have gone down 50, 60, 70% in real terms since 15 years ago. So, you know, one would hope that there'd be more of a move towards sort of universal access, at least that's what I would hope for. Um, and uh, that there'd be uh, more spending on public health so that we can anticipate and um, um, approach these kinds of things in the future. Yeah. Well, yeah thank sure. you. Uh, can you, um, that, those, those are pretty um, expansive statements, I must say. A lot to chew on. Um, uh, but, but John, you got your answer. So thank you for asking the question. We have several more questions teed up, and I'll just read your names and ask Michael, our technical producer, to turn your mics on so you can ask the questions yourself. And I'll give Michael the order so he can get prepared to do this. First up is Christine Robb, followed by Bruce Claflin, followed by Richard Grisaru. So, Let's start with Christine. Michael, if you would turn her mic on, please. Hello, do I have a mic? Yes. Okay, great. Um, my big question is, if you look at the numbers, uh, with the mortality rate, um, how many people have to die before we have herd immunity? Well, I put that number together back in January, kind of anticipating this. And if you think that we need to get to about, probably about right now, we think about 66% is reasonable. So let's say 200 million um, uh, people um, uh, uh, need to get infected. It may be a little bit more than that. Um, and then you give yourself a 0.5% mortality rate. Uh, you come in right at 1 million people die. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of what we've got right now is that there'll be 300,000 people dead by um, election day. Um, and if we get a bad fall with this, you know, that number, you know, could um, uh, repeat itself by, oh, say, uh, sometime in February, March. So, you know, that's why I said the sad thing about our country, the really sad thing is that, you know, sort of we're spending a lot of money and, and, and making a tremendous effort around a vaccine, but um, you know, we may get to herd immunity first. Now, you know, I, I, back in January, when I sort of gave this kind of talk, I tried to make the point, what people don't realize is that there's 60, 70, 80,000 people a year who die from flu. And so you have to get to, you know, something that's like 10 times worse than the average flu season. And most people in hospitals realize that the flu season stresses them out. You know, the hospitals get full and um, uh, they can't take new patients. So when, when you, you mention that to a hospital, you realize that the real damage that's done, the collateral damage that's done is that the healthcare system basically is shut down and you can't do anything other than take care of COVID patients. Yeah, as a, as a physician who's, who's doing urgent care, a family physician, I am dreading the fall. I am dreading it. It's gonna be awful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think All right. Thank you, Christine. I see you have a second question, but we'll circle back to you um, after I take a couple more. And I think Bruce Claflin is next. Michael, if you can turn his mic on. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that we're kind of out of control as a nation, yet there are certain states and regions of the nation that appear to be in control 
and in fact think they can stay in control even as they somewhat open up. So the question is, if the rest of the nation adopted those practices that other states with success have implemented, even with the fall in a second wave, couldn't we get the nation back into control, flatten the curve, buy time until there's a vaccine? Or do you believe that's just out of the realm of possibility? Well, so far it's been out of the realm of possibility simply because you know the whole issue about um, uh, social distancing and wearing masks and the like got politicized. And um, you know, there's certain people who now firmly sort of believe that this is all just a sort of political matter. And the states that are out of control right now have been able to demonstrate no ability, none whatsoever, to um, undertake the most simple sort of public health measures. It'll be interesting to see what happens in Texas, where you know the governor is a strong-willed individual, and you know at least uh, has been reacting to um, this. Uh, it's not really a second wave, but uh, basically the sort of strengthening um, of the first wave. But you look at other places like Georgia and uh, Florida, and you just don't. You know, there's just no evidence that they're going to be able to exert the kind of um, uh, police control necessary. When I say police, I don't really mean like the individual police, but more like the police power of the state, that they're able to exercise that in a way that's going to be um, um, efficacious. I think that the, uh, a good friend of mine, Arnie Epstein, talking about this back in April, he said, you know, the major issue in the United States is the federal system. So, which was true, you know, you can't have the same reaction. So what Cuomo might do or Baker might do in New York or Massachusetts, um, is uh, not the same as what uh, DeSantis might do um, in Florida. But the bigger problem is sort of uh, travel. You know, sort of if I'm, if I'm Baker or I'm um, uh, Como right now, I'm beginning to think about whether or not I take any flights in at all, you know, um, uh, from other parts. And it's a little bit difficult to understand exactly sort of how they exert that police power. But you can't be importing the virus um, by air flight or train from other parts um, of the country. I think New England does have a chance of, um, of uh, getting through the fall uh, without a major uh, increase in cases. But as I said, you know, sort of that concentration of virus in the environment sort of generally sort of moves in one's direction. All right, thank you, Bruce, for that question and Troy for your answer. Richard Grisaru has a question. Michael, if you can make his mic live. Hi, this is Michael. I'm going to read this out loud for folks because um, Richard doesn't actually have a microphone. Okay. Um, who can we look to to take the lead in rebuilding our public health system post-pandemic? Having seen the economic devastation what hope do you have that the business community will rally behind efforts to solve this problem? Well, I think, you know, I've, I've always been a proponent um, of um, the view that um, there's money to be made in good public health and so corporations should be involved in it. You know, the, 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 we operate a series of sort of retail clinics and we've been trying to get the pharmacists to do um, more health care. That's all based on a perception I had from the um, uh, what the British were trying to do about eight or 10 years ago when they were no longer than that now, 12, 15 years ago, when they were going to open up, you know, sort of public health stations at pharmacies to supplement what the, um, and complement what the um, uh, GPs were doing in their practices. And I've always believed that, you know, the um, uh, pharmacies can be involved in vaccinations and public health advice um, and basically work closely with the primary care doc doctors in this country to uh, effectuate better sort of um, overall public health um, outcomes. So I think there's a real possibility there. And I think that, you know, sort of uh, corporate America can be used to um, uh, do that. But the more important thing is that you have to spend tax dollars on reasonable people who are going to work for the individual states and, and, and local counties and be able to address uh, public health issues. And we just simply haven't been willing to sort of pay for that. I think, you know, sort of, I don't know who does that in the second Trump administration. I just don't see the um, uh, vigor and in, uh, interest in public health that would be sort of necessary. But I could see a number of people who go to work for the Biden administration who would 
uh, be quite interested in trying to sort of reestablish that public health infrastructure that's basically non-existent at this point. I mean, there's a very good book um, about uh, um, uh, the sort of development of capitalism in China, um, of all things, uh, called Capitalism Alone uh, by an Italian economist who teaches at the University, uh, City University of New York now. Uh, but uh, it makes the point, you know, that he makes the point that there's two forms of capitalism in the world now. There's sort of our liberal form, and then there's the Chinese corporatist form. Um, and people are always looking for examples of sort of how well those approaches to capitalism, because it says there is no other um, uh, economic system other than capitalism uh, today. But which of those works better? And you've got to be impressed with um, the way that the Chinese state, I know it's not a popular thing to say, in the United States today, but you have to be impressed with the way that they've dealt with um, um, uh, addressing this virus. Now, there's no civil rights, there's no civil liberties in that country, and we would never want to give those up. But the fact that they have sort of local uh, infrastructure to be able to deal with public health issues is something that we should be able to maintain all of our core values and still be able to emulate. Thank you, Troy. It looks as if we have a question from Karen Carpenter. Can you open her mic, Michael? Hi, uh, is that uh, uh, mic working? Yes. This is uh, Tom using Karen's computer, but the, um, the question is, you know, there's been a lot of focus on the vaccine approach, but is there anything on the horizon that can uh, alter the course of the severity of the viral infection. Uh, is there anything that looks promising? You know, we read little reports about other drugs being repurposed uh, for this, but um, what is the status of that? And is there any chance that that can at least mitigate the severity of the disease as um, people get it? Well, a couple, lots of things in trial right now, and a couple of things that probably work somewhat um, as people get really sick. Probably the best one is um, an old um, uh, treatment, uh, use of intravenous uh, corticosteroids to basically sort of slow the immune system down, um, something that we've been doing for uh, years and years. Uh, there's some antivirals like remdesivir that um, appear to have a reasonable uh, uh, impact overall on a hospital course. But mostly sort of what we're seeing are things that are probably going to be helpful for treatment once somebody's in the hospital and really quite sick. And I think there's also been some advances made just in terms of understanding how to um, uh, deal with this sort of uh, terrible adult respiratory distress syndrome that people uh, develop um, uh, when they get really sick uh, with the virus. Uh, but, you know, there's no, certainly what, uh, a lot of things uh, that were hoped for, especially by the administration, which would be sort of magic bullets that one could take uh, on an oral basis and be able to use as a prophylaxis. That's just simply, um, 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 I, I think that's just simply a matter uh, that uh, was wishful thinking. Um, and I don't see anything that's in trial right now that's going to be dramatic. I think it's going to be helpful if you're in an ICU at a hospital for both the doctors taking care of you and you as a patient. All right, uh, do I see that Sue Stafford has a question? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, my question is for, for those of us um, <laughs> in the vulnerable category of age. Given that the vaccines, as I've been reading, are, any, are predicted to be anywhere from, I guess, 30% um, effective to 80%, um, what's the prognosis for, for those of us who are um, most at risk, elderly people, <laughs> um, to, to get back to normal within, I mean, to be able to, to safely go to a restaurant within a year, two years, three years? I mean, even with a vaccine, how, how likely is it that things will, will get normal for the, for the older people in the population? 
I, you know, I would hope by next summer, um, you know, there'd be a reasonable enough amount of vaccination uh, that um, yeah, you'd feel comfortable sort of going back uh, into crowded restaurants and things like that. You know, it'll be sort of probably three or four years before I'll go back to a crowded restaurant here in the South End in, um, in um, uh, Boston. But, you know, I'd go to uh, uh, not so crowded restaurants um, and, um, you know, at some point, I guess I'll eat out again, um, uh, maybe outside. But um, the best uh, epidemiologist um, um, associated uh, so far is a fellow named Lischitz, who's from uh, the uh, Harvard School of Public Health. He's done the best work in terms of the mathematical mo modeling. and has also been the most perspicacious in terms of predicting. And, you know, he wrote a paper back in March saying this is going to think is going to sort of bump along until 2022, likely. So... You know, without a vaccine, you know, we'd be in for sort of a two to three year period of time where things are going to be slow like this. Troy, we're usually pretty disciplined about bringing things to a close at 630. But selfishly, I'd like to ask you a question if you're willing to stay on for one more. I can take one more. Okay, yeah. thank you. So... I've been active on corporate boards and I continue to be active in networks of corporate board members. And I'm finding that there is a high degree of responsibility in taking charge of um, measures, conditions, protocols that they need to, corporate leaders need to implement in their corporations in order to make their employees feel safe and their customers feel safe, and to be good community citizens. In your role, are you seeing some of that leadership gaining any momentum that could give us some hope for leadership from that sector? And of course, the large corporations cross state boundaries, mm -hmm. so they could presumably have influence in some of these states that are most irresponsible. Yes, yes, yes. We have about um, uh, 30 or 40 million beneficiaries on our Aetna business, and then uh, just over 100 million in our Caremark business. So we have a big B2B business, and we do a lot of um, work with corporations. And they've been aggressive from the outset in terms of trying to understand what they should do, how they should react, what they should do to uh, protect their workforce, uh, what are the appropriate sort of public health steps? And so I feel very good about that. They've been very rational um, and they've been assertive and they've been proactive. And uh, there's a variety of very interesting solutions being developed for them that we didn't talk about around contact tracing and testing and things like that. So I think we can feel good about that portion of it. Uh, but to some extent, you know, the, the broader um, um, uh, means of addressing a pandemic like this belong to the government. And um, mm -hmm. we've seen some governments do a very good job, but we've seen a lot of governments that haven't. Right. Well, that's a good note to end on. Uh, we are extremely grateful for having your expertise be brought to the island um, this Sunday afternoon. We thank you, and we hope that we might be able to welcome you in person in the not too distant future. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. That's so nice of you. Yes. Have a great rest of the summer. Thank you. Over and out. And thank you all for participating. Look forward to seeing you next week.